Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you. If you have your Bibles or if you want to take out the pew Bible in front of you, let's look up Romans 12, 12 together. I know it's not in the bulletin, but it's, uh, if you listen to this uh, past week on our Wednesday Facebook Live Bible study, which is every Wednesday at 10 a.m., you come to the church's Facebook page, and we are in about a 15-minute Bible study. You know that this week I talked from Romans 12, 12. You'll find Romans in the New Testament after the book of Acts. And here Paul writes, Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, be faithful in prayer, persevere in prayer. I just think that's a great, short verse that you can memorize, that you can write down and keep in front of you, because it's about being joyful in our hope, having the hope not only of our salvation, but the sustaining hope, the courageous hope that we have that comes from God, and be patient in suffering, be patient in affliction knowing that we will go through some tough times, but to be patient, giving time for God to work. And then, most importantly, persevere in prayer. Be faithful in prayer. Persevere in prayer. Be faithful in prayer. Continue to pray. So, just wanted to bring that to your attention. And I think it's a a good verse to kind of always have on the tip of your tongue. In the forefront of your mind. So if you open your bulletin to the very back page where it says this week at GRCC, the Gender Road Christian Church, you'll notice that next Sunday, the 28th, at the end of each service, there is the next Your Church, Our Future gathering. So the Your Church, Our Future gatherings is a time for you to come in and to talk about what are your views on the mission of the church, the vision of the church, uh, how we can Um, go forward and and be the church in this point in time here in this community, what it is that you want from a church, what it is you want to help the church do. And so we need your input. We need your feedback. And so next Sunday after the service ends, uh, Bill Sykes, and then I'll be there at some point, uh, will help facilitate that meeting so we can get your input. And then we'll have um, one on Wednesday then during the day, and then one one on Wednesday evening of, of the following week right at the end of January. And then we'll have more meetings in February, but it's important that you come in now and share that input. So I just want to raise that to your attention. So my friends, let us rise and stand as you are able, whether in body and spirit. Let's greet the Lord in prayer and then with our introits. Holy love, we thank you for this day, a time to come in and worship. And so we release our cares to you. We lift up our joys to you. And so we are open to the leading of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. On this third Sunday of Epiphany, I will be be reading from Psalms 139, verses 1 to 8, and verses 13 to 18. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You concern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before word on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hands upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed me inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, and I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderfully are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Can't say the word. Intrinsically wounds in the depths of the earth. Your eyes behold my unforced, uniform, I'm sorry. Your eyes behold my uniform substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them have yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts. O God, how vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. 
We heard the wording of the Lord. Just in case you did not see it, if you look in your bulletin on the 9 o'clock side at the very bottom where it says for both services, you'll see the first announcement. Allison, who has been our youth associate for three and a half years, is going to be moving on, leaving the church on February 4th. That's going to be her last day. So she has one more Sunday with us, and uh, it's going to hate to see her go, but she has a lot of talent, and, and I know she'll do well in where her journey is going. And she did something that was very mature and very responsible. She knew that we were going through the change to look and see how we would be staffed for the future, to see how we want to be structured for ministry. And she knew that she was in line for a promotion, that she might be getting some increased responsibilities and pay. But when she looked at where God was calling her and what she wanted to do with her life and then what those responsibilities would be here within the church, she decided that she would soon have to make a change. So instead of going through a change and a transition now, only then to leave later this year, she wanted to make that change now, which allows us to have that blank slate even more opportunity to look and see how we might be structured as well as having that the, the money that we would have been paying her to be used to decide how we want to allocate that towards another position. So that was very responsible on her part. So somebody said to me, because this has been known for about, um, about a week, and uh, we've made this announcement. You may have seen it on the prayer chain. So somebody said to me recently, well, John, aren't you nervous? Aren't you anxious? Because one of the secretaries, Becky, said, well, after then, it's just going to be me and you in the office. <laughs> I said, yeah, we're going to have uh, a lot more snacks to eat at the staff meeting. I said, no. I said, I'm not nervous. I'm not anxious. I met with my spiritual director on Thursday, and we were talking about this change. And I said to her, I said, you know, I, I keep telling myself I should be anxious or nervous because there's so much to do in the church, and we're already looking for an associate pastor, and, and now this critical role that Allison's been playing, we're you know, we got to have that filled. But I know Allison's working with uh, some folks here in the church that can step up in the interim and help out. And so I kept saying to my spiritual director, I feel like I should be nervous, but I'm not. I'm not anxious. Because God's given me peace that we're going to be okay. That God has a plan, that God is leading us. You may not remember or know of my, my story completely, but it was back in 2003 when I felt God calling me and was wondering what to do. It was then June of 2004 when I knew absolutely sure that God had called me into the ministry. But I had another job then. So that was June of 2004. I was um, going one path career-wise, had... Uh, a child that was not even a year old yet, another one on the way. God's calling me into ministry. And then for 18 months, I waited from June of 2004 until January of 06, knowing that God was going to call me somewhere to do something, but then waiting as God worked with me and built me. And then it was January of 06 where God said, you need to look into going to seminary. Not which one. God didn't lay out my whole life plan. Just need to go to seminary. So then I started looking into seminaries. And it was March 2006. And I'm like, God, I'm looking at these seminaries, but um, I've got two little babies, and I'm two-thirds of our income. And am I supposed to go there full-time, or what do I do? March 2006, on Saturday morning, driving to a church meeting, God said, you're going to quit your job and go full-time. Okay? It was pretty much that clear. So I called Tracy up, 
And she said, I know. God told me almost two weeks ago, but you had to figure that out yourself. I said, all right. But still not with seminary. It wasn't until the end of May of 2006 where I finally knew what seminary I was going to go to. And then in August of 2006, I quit my job, started in the seminary. So I'm okay with not knowing. I'm okay with God's leading because God's with us. Just as we read in the psalm, God's with us. God's leading us. And as we're going to talk about today, we don't do this ministry by ourselves. We don't do this ministry alone. We go through this together. So I'm not anxious. Now, that's not to say that I don't worry about things or get, you know, stressed out over some things. I'm human. That happens. But this is where we rely on that spirit, where our head is telling us one thing and our emotions are telling us another thing. But then there's this something inside that you know and you know you know it, and you're okay with that. That's how the leading of the Spirit works. And so my, my friends and family, that's how we'll get through this. One step at a time, one, one word of God at a time. Let us pray together our prayer of illumination. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So do you know why we say a prayer of illumination? Um, so a prayer of illumination is a, a prayer that illuminates that when we hear the scripture, that the Holy Spirit illuminates or shows us, gives us revelation as to its meaning. So when we say the prayer of illumination, we're asking God that in the reading of the word, in the preaching of the, the message, that, that we get what we need to get from, from God's Holy Spirit. So that by the time I say it, and the time you hear it, you get out of it what you need to get out of it. Even if I mess it up, and as somebody told me before, that's like, yeah, God has that autocorrect feature. So that by the time I say it, it autocorrects to what you need to hear from that. So sometimes we do things in church, we do them so often or so much, we can forget, well, why do we do that? So just wanted to throw that out there. So we're reading today from the Gospel of Mark, and we've been in Mark since, uh, in and out of Mark since uh, the, the Advent time, and, and we've covered the baptism of Jesus. But here we are in chapter one of the Gospel of Mark the 14th chapter. Now, things have been busy. We know that, that, that Mark proclaims that here comes Jesus, that John the Baptist has been there. Jesus has been baptized. Jesus has gone out in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He's come back into the region of Galilee, and John the Baptist has been baptized or been, been arrested. And we're just on verse 14. There's a lot going on within the gospel of Mark. Mark is a, a concise gospel. It's the oldest of the synoptics, of, of meaning the Matthew, Mark, Luke uh, gospels. And Mark is about helping us understand that the, the time is now, that there's been this culmination of historic events, that now is the time for God to be acting here on the earth through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is now going to be calling his disciples, and the time is such, the response is such, that we need to respond to this call. And so We've heard these stories before. We, it's Jesus calling the fishermen to be disciples. I mean, you probably heard the story when you were a youngster in Sunday school class. Most are familiar with Jesus calling them out of their boats to leave their nets and to go be fishers of, of men. And so we're going to hear this again, and maybe it'll ring something different, or maybe you'll be like, yeah, I've, I've heard that before, but let's read in here. So chapter 4, or verse 14 of chapter 1. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. 
And as he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Seems like a pretty simple story, doesn't it? But there's a lot packed in there that that we need to understand. There's words in there that would have been familiar with the preaching and teaching of, of Jesus and the disciples and the people would have resonated with. There's those that would have understood from the culture what they meant by, why is it fishermen? You know, we've westernized Christianity so much that we can miss some of the richness and the meanings of what Mark is trying to understand. You've had the advantage of 2,000 years of interpretation in these messages. So let's go back through there and unpack a few things. Jesus really does give one of the most concise sermons ever. He goes and says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. That's it. Let's all go home. Not really. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So we know that in John the Baptist's call for repentance and the way he was baptizing people, that they were to repent, they were to change their minds, to turn around, to, to think in a new way. Last week we talked about that as the church reformats, as the church repents, we become a more authentic, more selfless church and will emerge in a way that we are no longer focused on ourselves or on our own viewpoints. We go out into the world differently. Last week, we also talked about in John's calling of the disciples, Jesus saw something greater in us than we see in ourselves, right? Jesus sees something greater in us than we see in ourselves. Jesus saw Nathaniel under the, the fig tree. God saw Samuel laying on the floor. We fail to see ourselves as God sees us. God searches for us and knows us better than we know ourselves. But here we have now where Jesus is going through, he's back in the region of Galilee. And he says to them, he's proclaiming the good news, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. But I wonder if people really believed this, understood this, experienced this, because John the Baptist had just been arrested. This one who was, as people were looking at him, is, is maybe the Messiah, and like, no, it's Jesus Jesus. He's just been arrested. The Roman Empire was still in control and still oppressing people. How could they see that the kingdom of God has come near? And I think that resonates with us today, right? The kingdom of God has come near. How does that fit into how we see the world and what is happening? This gospel, the good news of God that's being proclaimed. But we know that the kingdom of God has come near. It is dawning. It is drawn near to us. It's not fully manifest. And Mark in chapter 13 will tell us it won't be fully manifest until Jesus comes again, until the apocalypse, until the kingdom of God is fully manifest. So we live now in this time where there is evil, where there is sin, when there is brokenness, when there are things that happen that we don't like. For Mark, he knows that the world is going to resist Jesus, that the world is going to continue to resist the will of God. And that's why for Mark, the first miracle, which comes shortly after this story, is an exorcism to show that Jesus is in triumphant over evil, that the strong man, as he talks about, that the strong man's kingdom is not the one that will win, but it is indeed God's kingdom that is near. We talked last week about the tearing apart, the rendering of the heavens when the spirit, the dove, came down. This new way, this rendering has happened. And for Mark, for this audience that would have been reading the gospel of Mark for the first time, he wants them to see that now is a time that when Jesus calls you, there needs to be an immediate response. Immediately they left their nets. Immediately Jesus called them. The time to act is now. Do we sense that same urgency? Probably not. We get tired. It's been 2,000 years. Jesus hasn't come back again. Maybe I don't have to react so quickly. So we start thinking about our own comfort versus our commitment. So the time is fulfilled, Jesus says here. What does it mean the time is fulfilled? 
Well, the term time here, there's two terms for time in, in the Greek, kairos and chronos. So it's not talking about chronos or chrono chronology or the, you know, the mundane, ordinary minutes, hours that go by, but it's kairos, which means there's an opportune time, a divine time. God is acting right now through Jesus Christ to bring about this kingdom, that now is the time for God's action and activity. And Jesus said, let the scriptures be fulfilled. We can miss this, right? We just think, oh, it's a prophetic thing. The scriptures had to come true and we, we move on. But I want you to come back to this because it's let the scriptures be fulfilled. Let the scriptures be completed. Let the scriptures be brought to perfection. Let the scriptures come to their intended end to be filled, to be overflowing, to go beyond expectation. Is that for me? You made something for me last week, too. Thank you. And it's on my desk. I will put that up there. Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate it. I'm going to set it right here. Don't let me forget it afterwards. Okay? So Jesus is saying that now, so even when those back then saw one in the, being arrested, even when they saw that Jesus was being retaliated against, even when we wonder and we're in our times of disappointment, our times of betrayal, our times of violence, and our apparent failure, when things are happening that no one expected, the kingdom of heaven has drawn near, the time is fulfilled, and this is the good news, that God continues to show up where we least expected, that God is in all of those situations, and God continues to be, yes, so when you're at home and you are spiraling downward, and you are thinking things, how can they get any worse, or you're feeling alone, you're feeling depressed, God is there with you. I say it, hear it, believe it, pray, be patient in affliction, persevere in prayer. Then Jesus says in verse 15, repent. There is a need to repent. Oftentimes, we don't like to do that. It makes us uncomfortable to repent. Why would I want to repent? Why would I want to say I'm sorry? Why, why do I need to confess to God? Well, God knows everything I do anyways. Yes, confess. Name it. Own it. Confess it to God. Repent, which in the Greek means to change your way of thinking. In Hebrew, we know it means to turn around. You're doing a 180. You're reorienting your life to God. What Jesus is saying is, I want you to wrap your mind around this new reality. That as the kingdom of heaven is drawn near, and I am ushering this new way of being and living, reorient how you think, what you believe. Think in a new way. And then Jesus says, believe in the good news, to have faith and believe in the good news. We are asked to believe. We are asked to have faith. And we know that throughout the gospel, Mark, that we will encounter different people that show different dimensions of faith. The friends of the paralyzed man that tore apart the roof and lowered him into there to be G near G Jesus. That there was Jairus, the synagogue leader, the woman with the issue of blood, the father of the epileptic son, and the blind beggar named Bartimaeus, all had faith in different ways. So now let's get to the calling of the two brothers. Why call two people? Why call James and John? Why call Simon and Andrew? Why not just, you know, okay, we get the point, just call somebody to be his disciple and move on. Why call two people? Because it starts to show us that being in ministry, being a follower, being a disciple of Christ is a shared ministry, that you're not going to do this alone. Now, we don't know what the call was. It could have been an authoritative call or command. It could have been a prophetic call. It could have been a gentle invitation. Whatever it is, they were called and they responded. But we also, in light of what is happening in the Me Too movement, in the Church Too movement, and what we see happening in our cultures, we need to understand that Jesus also had female and women disciples. In Mark chapter 15, it reads, verse 40, there were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger of Joseph and Salem. And they used to follow him and provided for him. They, they served, they were the diaconate, the deacons, when he was in Galilee. 
And there were many other women who had come along up, had come up with him to Jerusalem. We know that there was the woman in the crowd in Mark chapter 5, the Syrophoenician mother, the one who anointed Jesus in Mark. We need to hear, everyone hear, that you are called as a disciple. Now what did these brothers do? What was their profession? Fishermen. All right. Why fishermen? We see the act of fishing, of casting nets, two things happen that the Hebrews, the Israelites, would have understood. That when you fish, you cast out your net and you catch the fish. The second act is then you then have to sort the good from the bad. The disciples are to go out and catch. Jesus, God, will then do the sorting after that. They were fishermen, and there was a little detail in there that We really kind of miss. They left their father, right? They left. Now we hear that is left, but what we miss from the original Greek is this left is abandoned. It's the same verb that is used in chapter 14, verse 50, when the disciples abandoned Jesus the night that he was arrested, betrayed. There was a stark separation. What this alludes to is that being a disciple, a committed follower of Jesus Christ, will not be easy. This way of expectation will not always be easy. But you see, God is a boundary crossing God, and God comes in and sees that even within our relationships, within our family, they will all be reordered within this kingdom of God. They operate differently. And so I wonder, when they left their father, what would that scene have been like? Thank you. I'm getting such great gifts today. I appreciate it. I'm going to put it right up here and I'll hang it up in my office. See, if one of you wants to preach, you too will get really good artwork. Okay? Even Jesus' family thought he was losing his mind. In chapter 3, it reads that Jesus went home and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to restrain him for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. When you start following Jesus, some things can happen. Things change. And so we follow here and Following is a key, um, key term and this key discipleship importance for Mark. Jesus wants followers, the disciple, uh, learners, what this means. And as disciples, they often lived with or near their rabbi because as a, as, a, as a student of the rabbi, you learn this whole way of life, this whole way of thinking. Jesus, rabbi, you, disciple, you are learning a whole new way of thinking and living. See how this starts to sink into us? It's not just a story that Mark's telling us. It's the reality of what we believe and follow and do today. Fishermen, when they left, they left the father and the hired men. What this means is that these people that were being called were at least middle class, in the sense that they had money, sufficiency. So to leave all that and follow a rabbi, to let everything go behind, helps show the importance that their calling was divine, that their calling was coming from God. But what it also helps us understand is that this call to witness to the realm of God takes presence over our present sufficiency. That this call to witness to the realm of God takes precedence over our present sufficiency. That this call to witness to the realm of God takes precedence or importance over our current sufficiency needs and comforts. Yes, discipleship always has a cost. Discipleship always has a cost. There's some people that are afraid to follow Jesus, to be committed to Jesus, because they're afraid they're not going to have fun anymore. 
I don't know if I'll be able to do those same things or go to these same places, hang out with the same people. What's my life going to be like? What will they think of if, if I'm really following Jesus? I'll let you process that. But in chapter 8, Jesus, we know that as a committed disciple, as a follower, that we do deny ourselves that we're asked to bear the cross. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Following is being more than just curious. Following is a decision that you make, understanding what is my next step? What is the next thing that God is asking me to do? What is the next step that I need to take in my journey of faith so that I can understand what it is to be a disciple of Christ? Where is it within my life that I need to make a change, that next step that I need to make that helps me develop this relationship with God? This relationship with God, which means how I treat God, but how I treat myself, how I treat my neighbor, how I treat my family, how I treat my friends, how I treat the people that I go to school with. This is this whole way of thinking and following. If you really, truly understand the comprehensiveness of this, it can seem overwhelming, which is why we focus on the next step, the next thing. We know the following Jesus as being a shared ministry. That means we have others around us to help us follow Jesus, to see that we're being saved by Jesus, to remind you of who you are and who you are called to be. We talked about that last week, who you're called to be, to be that person in God. We have others around us in this shared ministry of being disciples so that we can see you. They help you see you, to help you appreciate you and to celebrate you. We talked about the importance of being you, this person God created you to be on Christmas Eve. We come alongside each other so that we realize we're not alone. Okay, so if I say the word comfort, what do you think of? Shout it out. Comfort. Contentment, comfort. What is it? Relaxation, a warm blanket, right? Comfortable snuggling in. What else? Comfort. Okay, so what if I say the word commitment? What do you think of when I say the word commitment? Work? Serious actions, spouse, dedication. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1, comfort, oh comfort, my people, says your God. We look at commitment in Psalm 37, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. In Proverbs 16, 3, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. So we start looking at what is comfortable and commitment, because I, I look at younger people, those who um, are even maybe narcissistic, narcissistic in, in their thinking, those who are self-centered, they want to be comfortable. They want to do those things that make themselves feel good, to get what they want, to eat, to drink, to make themselves feel comfortable. And we can even see that in, in the relationships of young ones. There's more of a sense of they, need, they want to be comfortable as they learn what it is to be in relationship versus commitment. Commitment is a strong sense of intention and focus, the state of quality of being dedicated to a cause, an activity, a pledge, an undertaking, an engagement, or an, ob or an obligation. Now, this is just for fun, throwing this out here. I found this on a website, I think it was called Lifehack or something like that. 11 signs that you're in a committed relationship. Okay, 11 signs that you're in a committed relationship. And you can tell this is new age because there's going to be things in there that in the 1980s you would, would not have been a sign you're in a committed relationship. One, you spend significant time together. Number two, you include each other in regular purchases. You get a key. Number four, 
you don't shun social media shout outs. Now, some of you may be saying, what? All right, so in other words, if someone is dating someone and they post on social media, oh, you know, it was with my girlfriend, and then the other person is like, no, 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 don't say I'm your girlfriend yet on social media, or they don't let you post that. That's, that's what that means. So in other words, you're not committed yet if you can't say that out on social media. You enter into contracts together. You vacation together. You talk about bodily functions. <laughs> Number eight, you plan for the future together. Number nine, you share passwords and PIN numbers, right? All those electronic things you got to log into, you share that. Again, that's a sign you're a committed relationship. Number 10, you go out of your way for one another. And number 11, you make decisions based on the other person's situation. Just a little fun, but ways to help us start getting the sense of committed. How committed am I in what I do in my spiritual life and my religious life. And so when, if you have a Kairos view of time, in other words, that opportune time, now is the time, that's a committed view. For example, we only have a brief opportunity to shepherd our kids when they are still young children. That's a committed view that I'm going to do what it takes right now because I know they're only young once. Number two, when a friend is experiencing pain, we have a brief window of time in which to reach out to them. That's a Kairos view of time. That means an opportune time you see as you're committed to being able to help them right then when they are in need. Are we committed or are we comfortable? If you're a comfortable Christian, maybe that's something to think about. Because if I'm comfortable, I'm probably not really dedicating my life to prayer, listening to what God is getting me to do. Because there's always the sense that there can be more, that things can be a different way, that we can fill more seats, that we can preach the gospel, that we can extend love to somebody who hasn't experienced love. When I was talking with my spiritual director on Thursday, I was sharing with her problem, a challenge that's in my life that's very concerning. And a lot of times it's not until you're speaking this out loud and having somebody help you work through it that you realize how, <laughs> you know, how rough it is or weird it is or the challenge you have. And so I kept saying that I'm, you know, I'm always in this conversation. And she said, that's not logical. There's nothing logical about what you're doing. That person's not changing. I said, yes, but... I believe in this Jesus of reconciliation. I believe in this Jesus of restoration, which means I'm going to face that situation every time, believing it will be different. It's not always different. That's why Romans 12, 12 comes up, that we are to be patient in affliction, to persevere in prayer. But see, commitment, what are you committed to? What are you willing to do? And so we realize that when Jesus says, follow me, that means more followers are coming. More help is coming in different ways. We realize that we cannot live into our, our jobs or our vocations on our own, that we can't live into our truth on our own, that we cannot follow Jesus on our own, that we cannot preach on our own, that we need each other. Jesus is calling and we need each other. So my friends, as you consider what your next step is, first decide, are you comfortable or are you committed? Amen.